provides Dr. Love R. Cole, sir, to de uh, deliver today's lecture. Dr. Love, sir. Can you guys hear me now? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, awesome. So I'm sorry, there was some miscommunication, I believe. Um, I thought Gopal said we start at 10.30. So, but anyway, um, I'm here and you folks are there. So let's start uh, this. Let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, and you probably need to see this one, I guess, right? So. So which one you guys are seeing? Um, Your complete screen is visible, sir, right now. Means along with the next slide also. Okay, so I probably want to change that one to other one. Okay, I think now you're seeing one screen. Yeah, done, sir. Okay, good. So. I think we are, what, 10 minutes late, sorry. Um, uh, so I want to start, but before that, I want to tell uh, Dr. Beg and uh, was it Dr. Ingle? Yes, sir. Um, make sure, because what happens, and, and this is from my prior experience, what happens is when I'm speaking, every few slides, uh, the audio would be off. So just message me in the chat window Mm -hmm. um, then, then I can, you know, um, fix or restart that particular slide onwards. And, and it, it is for, for example, like for whatever reason on zoom, it's, it's becoming a problem for, for slides that I'm presenting. So. Sure, anyway, sir. So, sure, sir. Yeah. Sure. Sir. We, we will be in touch with you. And if there is any problem arise, technical problem, we will message you, sir. Okay, sure. Okay. So let's get started. Uh, good, good morning to all of you. Um, uh, it's great pleasure. Uh, Dr. Gopal is putting this, uh, with your team there. Uh, this is a good way to interact and, and exchange a few thoughts uh, on things that we are doing in Washington State. So again, um, you know, um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Prishna Agriculture and Automation Technologies for specialty crop production management, right? So um, again, uh, Dr. Ingle, I think, did uh, the introduction there. Uh, just to reiterate, I am with uh, Washington State University. Uh, there's a Department of Biological Systems Engineering. Um, and, and within that, we have ag automation group. Uh, so our my my research fits into that. So I do precision agriculture, um, and I'm also affiliated with Center for Precision and, and Automated Ag Systems. Um, uh, that's part of Washington State University, right? So for next 40 45 minutes, I'm going to talk a um, few things about uh, you know the topic uh, that is here for discussion today. Uh, I wanted to start by um, uh, introducing what is specialty crops, right? Uh, so in US, um, USDA, in fact, has, you know, defined specialty crops as crops, something like tree fruit crops, you know, berries, grapes, vegetables, um, nut crops, and uh, anything that is, you know, grown with irrigated agriculture, perennial or non-perennial um, is considered, you know, a specialty crop. Um, and, and, you know, uh, USDA has a special focus and, and research uh, funding going into these crops because these are high value crops and, and th those are the crops that are like kind of nutritional and all these things besides, you know, cereal crops that we grow elsewhere, including Washington State. So uh, just to give background about Washington State, um, I, I, I hope you are seeing the screen here with the, the map of the state. So this is Washington State, Seattle is somewhere here. Uh, rather here actually. And then um, um, what you see here is a you know, number of crops that we grow in Washington state, right? Uh, and you can see uh, the color graphs that are here. Um, we grow, you know, you know, a lot of apples. We are number one in uh, fresh market apple production in US. Um, again, number one in uh, blueberries, sweet cherries, uh, number two in potato and, and grapes and so many other crops. So, you know, we have very diverse agriculture um, and, and because we have different climatic zones and such, uh, but most, again, to just reiterate, uh, the crops that we grow, 
the high valley crops they are grown in central part of washington here and our center for krishna ag is is located here and then, and our hence our focus is 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 on some of these crops that are grown in this central um, part of the you know washington state right so um, knowing what specialty crops are, I wanted to go back and define what's called Prishna agriculture. And you probably have seen this um, you know, definition everywhere you know, of the Prishna agriculture. In, in case of my program, um, the definition of Prishna agriculture is very simple. It's producing more with less and, and more is the you know, yield or quality of the produce and less is the crop inputs. And we further, you know, modify this is producing more with less for healthy beings. So what matters is whatever we produce um, creates healthy communities and and healthy beings than just having, you know, uh, more yield. But if we eat that and have you know, more pesticides on and then some other things go in your body and you know, you create, you know, uh, kind of unhealthy communities, and that's not sustainable. So that's the definition of Krishna agriculture for my program. And, and you probably know all this, right? So this is the uh, circle of Krishna agriculture where we have, you know, satellites up in the air uh, for georeferencing guidance and also getting some sensing done. Uh, but and again, using that satellite-based data or something on the ground, we do a lot of, you know, geospatial mapping. We measure things uh, like soil variability, crop variability, and, and things like that, and analyze the spatial patterns, understand the variability, then once we know the variability, what we do is we do manage that. So management is do it done with what is called variable rate technology. So for row crops, um, you know, that could be, you know, a variable rate uh, fertilizer applicator or variable rate irrigation. Uh, for tree fruit crops or vegetable crops, it could be, besides irrigation, it could be variable rate orchard sprayer that's applying chemicals based on the demand and, and variability in, in the orchards, things like that. And then as we do measure and manage, then we need to go back and see how we did for a given season. And that is called, you know, again, yield mapping, yield estimation, that kind of measurement and analytics. And then we keep repeating this year after year. And, and, and just like, you know, um, the farmers have wisdom and, and we create additional data layers and, and growers or farmers then uh, kind of become an expert uh, with use of the technology and, and following the concept of Prishnan agriculture. Right, so that's the you know uh, the big picture of Krishna agriculture. Then nowadays you probably have heard of what is called digital agriculture or smart agriculture, anything else that you say. So there, you know, again it's the same flavor, um, having different icing on the cake. Uh, the 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 core stays the same. We do measure, we do manage, uh, analyze, and we do manage. Right. So measurement, analytics, and management stays the same. It's rather, you know, we are using a lot more sensors. Uh, you can see sensors on the ground, the, you know, different weather stations. And we'll talk about some of the advances there. And, 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 and you know, the sensors on your equipments and you are sensing a lot more than what you used to. Uh, of course, we used to do sensing with satellites. Nowadays we have low orbiting satellites and, you know, um, you know circling the globe every other day and giving that data inputs. And then we have drones and such. And then all the data is now going to the cloud, being analyzed uh, using AI or machine learning tools. And then that information, real time or near real time, is transferred to the um, equipment on the ground. And then we do manage, um, you know, the variability. Um, we using, you know, the smart or automated equipments. And that's, you know, the big picture of digital agriculture. Again, digital agriculture goes beyond uh, infield production and management. It goes post harvest and in supply chain and all that. But for 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 the folks who want to, you know, implement this for uh, production side of the agriculture, uh, that's the big picture for you know uh, digital agriculture. And and so uh, staying in that domain, then my program at Washington State does focus on these three pillars or blocks of you know, um, uh, digital agriculture or fish agriculture. It is measurement, is it, it is analytics, and it is uh, management. Uh, so we do a lot of proximal and remote sensing. Um, we do a lot of decision support, uh, tools developments, apps, and other things. And we do develop technologies, um, including variable rate or you know, uh, next generation uh, orchard sprayers and such to apply crop inputs. And, and again, 
as you see these three pillars, you know, in US, it's a little bit different flavor um, in the sense that uh, we have the program and we don't get funding from the government uh, to continuously do this. We have to go and seek funding. So as we do this, you know, we write proposals or project proposals and, and go out and seek research and um, research funding from USDA or NSF National Science Foundation, USDA's United States Department of Agriculture and such. And then um, we do research projects. And that's why, you know, you will see, uh, you know, for example, in my program, my program is fish and agriculture, uh, but in a given year, I might be focused more on application technologies or in other years, I'll be focused more on, you know, uh, decision support tool developments and such, depending on the, the funding that is coming uh, from the federal governments. And it's a very competitive process, uh, if you want to know, right? So uh, staying to the research side, um, again, as I said, you know, central part of Washington, we grow a um, lot of high value crops and you know, that's where we are focused on. So most of the projects that I, I would be talking today, um, they would be you know, um, focused on some of the tree fruit crops like apples or cherries or pear, uh, some in grapes and potatoes and, and um, yeah, some other crops um, as, as you will see, right? So um, let's start talking about technologies that are out there to measure things. Uh, and the measurement, again, I'm focused more on um, understanding the crop or leaf level variability and, and, and not so much in the soil, but I'm gonna talk about the sensing tools that are there to understand such variability, right? So you probably know this if you have uh, gone through several you know, um, other lectures. Um, when we sense something, we are sensing um, the stress in the plant uh, that could be caused by like abiotic stresses. Abiotic are like you know climate variation or you know um, change in the rainfall intensity and and the stress induced in the plant because of the less water available to the plant and such. Um, that's abiotic. And then there is biological agents, you know pathogens, viruses, and and things like that that cause the stress to the plant, and that's biotic stress. So when we are doing crop sensing, we are looking for either abiotic or biotic. I think voice is mi missing. May I request Dr. Lokhot, sir? Your voice is missing. Hello. Okay. Ah, sir, your voice yeah, for last time. It's clear. Please mute all other participants. Their mic is now audible. Dr. Lokhot, sir, your voice is not audible right now. We are not able to hear you. Dr. Lokhot, sir. May I request Dr. Lokhot, sir, your voice is not audible. Dr. Lokhot, sir, 
but not audible. Uh, uh, voice is now yes your mic was un unmuted muted now uh, we are able to listen you sir please speak good. okay good because i was muted or unmuted um, several times so anyway so yeah i was talking about you know the handheld platforms um, then we have like what is called you know you have tractor or in, in US, we have what is called the agricultural utility vehicle that goes in and out of the orchard or grape wines. So you can have sensors in front, side, or in, in, in this case, we have sensors on the top. Um, and these are some of the sensors that we use in our research. But so you can do that kind of sensing as well, right? Uh, and then you, of course, have aerial sensing. You have um, drones. And, and, and in this case, what you are seeing is low orbiting satellites, right? Um, mm -hmm. So this is the point I think you might lose me. So just let me know and then um, we'll, we'll get going. Uh, in, so in terms of sensors, right, there are different types of optical sensors out there. Very simple example is your smartphone that you have. Uh, you can go back, you know, five or seven years back and, you know, you can, you know, relate. Uh, if you go out, you carry your flip phone and, and to communicate and then you carry another Kodak or some other camera, point and shoot type camera to take pictures. But nowadays you have a, sm a smartphone with nice, uh, what is called CMOS chip uh, type, uh, you know, um, sensor, RGB imaging sensor that takes, you know, very crisp 12 or so megapixel images and high definition videos and such. So those sensors you can put on the drones as well, right? Um, so again, these are visible uh, type, uh, you know, sensors. Then, you know, if you see want to see something beyond um, uh, visible domain, say about up, up to 680 nanometers or so, then you have to use what is called multispectral sensors. Um, and, and in that case, you know, where um, uh, you probably know NDVI, normalized difference vegetation index or some other indices that you get to understand the crop stress, uh, where you know, you know, that there is a crop stress, but you will not know why it is caused. You can get such information with multispectral uh, sensors. And here you see, uh, you know, five band uh, sensors. This is like, you can put them together to make it 10 band, or you can have this as, you know, two band sensor. Normally, most of the multispectral sensors are between three and 10 optical bands and that's out in the market, right? Um, and again, cost wise, you know, uh, these sensors, what you see here between uh, about 3000 to about $6,000, depending on, you know, the uh, optics that goes there and number of bands and such, right? Um, so these are again, uh, they, they just provide overview. They don't tell you why the stress is there, but they will tell that there is some variability that you see in the field and you go and do additional investigation on the ground. Uh, so now you can, of course, know the variability with uh, having very, you know, a narrow band optical sensors, what's called hyperspectral, right, sensing. And in this hyperspectral, you will have about 100 or 150 optical bands, very narrow bandwidth. So you are going to get very precise signature and, and three-dimensional hypercube um, to get to know that, okay, if there is a variability and, and you can probably relate why that variability is there, right? The problem with these sensors is the cost is one. Um, typically they cost about 40,000 plus because of the, you know, um, our optics and, and other things that are involved to sense beyond say 1000 or 1100 nanometers. And then um, the payload on the drones, these sensors are kind of problematic in the sense for US agriculture, an average farmer would have about uh, say 500 acres or 1000 acres plus acreage and, and, and doing the drone imaging with such optical hyperspectral sensors, you'll get about 10 minutes or so flight time 
and you don't cover beyond say 20 or 30 acres max and and doing 500 acres or 1000 acres or for example wheat farmers in in our region and they have about on average 3000 to 5000 acres of land so it doesn't you know make to the scale that we have for us agriculture but probably in in, in indian context you can probably still use that sensing um, for understanding the stress uh, there right and i you can you guys can still hear me right yes sir Good yeah, good. Then um, next is thermal imaging. There, you know, just like RGB imaging sensor will provide you the, you know, uh, pixelated image where each pixel has a grayscale value. In case of thermal imaging sensor, you get each pixel has a temperature value in that if you're taking image of, you know, uh, a given uh, field of view, then you will have uh, each pixel probably having temperature value of a soil pixel or plant pixel, depending on your resolution, all that, right? So in terms of advancements, you know, um, the lot has changed. You know, this is one of the sensor that is high-end sensor that was available a few years back, uh, about $35,000, $40,000 there. And it was bulky to put on the drones, but the same company, now you can see there is, you know, this is about $7,000 sensor, this is about $1,100 sensor. And this sensor literally can just attach to your smartphone to take thermal imaging sensors, right? The thermal imaging um, uh, data. And, and then, then uh, as long as you have what is called a radiometric calibrated thermal imaging sensor, then you can you know, uh, get a, a temperature value that you can use to understand, um, for example, crop water stress, uh, or you can use that data to in, in additional models to estimate crop ET. We're going to look at some of the examples of that. Or simply you just, you know, uh, you want to see the leaks in irrigation system and things like that. You can, you know, um, uh, use such thermal imaging sensing uh, data products. Uh, then we have what is called LIDAR. LIDAR is light detection and ranging. And, and, and this is uh, more applied to, you know, if you heard, if you have heard of some uh, lectures um, in this series where there's automation and robotics. So LIDARs are, you know, these are time of flight uh, type sensing where, you know, uh, the, the pulse is sent out and, and the time of flight is measured to see, you know, how far the object is from you or from the sensor. And you get what is called point cloud data. It's not an image, but a point cloud. And then using that point cloud, then you can reconstruct the, the environment and then the robots can you know, then operate in that environment knowing how far the you know, other things are. So same kind of uh, you know, sensing then can be also used to, for example, in orchard systems, you can use such sensors to reconstruct the tree canopies and see the change in the canopy vigor and, 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 and things like that with respect to time. Most of the variable rate sprayers or intelligent sprayers that you might have seen in the market they use LIDAR to understand the gaps in the canopies and um, the, the density or you know, uh, the cubic feet differences, and then apply the or actuate the nozzle, excuse me, on the back um, to, to do the variable rate actuation, right? And then uh, the combo is, you know, there's always something new. Um, what you are seeing here is a, you know, um, uh, the, the, the Mica Sense company in Seattle, they have this combo where they have combined uh, five band multispectral and, and this thermal imaging sensor here to, to have small form factor and still get uh, the, you know, the data for, of these two uh, types to understand the crop variability uh, in, a, in a small uh, payload um, you know, drone missions and such, right? So these are some of the sensors that you know, we have been using in our lab um, and, and, and there could be more. Uh, again, this list is not all inclusive, but uh, this is just to show the flavor on what goes on the drone or on the ground-based sensing platforms to sense few things, right? Again, that what you see here is not the, the end of the world, right? Um, you can see this is coming from Planet Labs, one of the company who is launching this low orbiting satellites, right? And they have this, uh, you can see, depending on the type of you know satellite, um, every few, or alternate days, you are getting between three meter or five meter to say about 0.8 meter um, resolution um, RGB and multispectral images. So um, 
the point that I'm trying to make here is drone is not the end of the world uh, for sensing. Um, you know, we have been using Landsat 7 or 8 type data, and then drones come in, and now we have what is called low orbiting satellites. And, and in fact, they are gaining popularity and a uh, lot more players are, you know, in this domain. Uh, this is a slide where, you know, you can see this, um, like there are about 5,000 satellites up in the air and, and counting. And, and, and importantly, this image is coming from Airbus, a company who developed this, um, you know, uh, commercial airplanes, they are now in the market to um, launch these low orbiting satellites. And, and they are working with, you know, players like Microsoft and such uh, to use that imagery for, uh, you know, doing something in, in commercial sector and also in agriculture. And, and, and right now, you know, we have seen some of the data that is coming out. It's about 0.5 meter and a good quality data, right? So you might not even need drones uh, to image and, and do remote sensing of your fields, right? Um, so anyway, so let's move on. I think this slide here is just to show that, you know, how resolution had changed uh, with respect to time. Um, as we started talking about Krishna agriculture, uh, for example, you know, um, this is one of the field um, uh, that, you know, with Landsat 7 or 8, you, you have 30 meter per pixel resolution. And, and you cannot even figure out that it's a circle. Um, and, 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 and to make a point in US, we have most of the you know, row crops or field crops, um, mostly the you know, irrigated field crops are, are grown in a circle because it's, it's you know, circle is, is about 130 acre um, block or circle. And you have, you see here, uh, there's you know, a way of irrigation. I have probably slide down there that you know, there is uh, what is called overhead sprinkler, sprinkler irrigation system, just like a rainfall. And that circle moves um, and it then irrigates this field. So that's why they call it circle. So uh, the point that I'm trying to make is in, in with Landsat 7 or 8, we cannot even see that the field is circle. But with nowadays with Sentinel that is giving 10 meters or rapid eye 5 meters, our planet giving 3 or 0.8 meters, you can see a lot more differences, right? And, and as you go high in the resolution, like planet, um, you can see here the vari variation in the field, the circle that is there, right? And, and so, and again, then the point is that you use these remote sensing platforms, the data products, understand where the problem is and then go fly the drone and, and quantify just like, you know, scouting on the ground, uh, quantify the variability and do something about, you know, managing that variability, right? So um, moving on, um, in terms of data analytics, I think um, in terms of commercial products, right, uh, that growers can use, um, I have seen PIX4D is one of the strongest, um, you know, player in the market. Um, uh, there might be, you know, I have not used, there's ArcGIS has a tool, what's called drone to map. I have not used it, but um, PIX4D is, is one of those products where you input the data, and, and you know thousands of images you know um, with simple graphical user interface you can stitch them you can uh, rectify geo rectification ortho mosaicing and all that thing and create some data products that somebody can use and and depending on you know the crop and the um, service provider in your country you probably will have somebody using this in the back end or some other uh, machine um, a data analytic machine in in the back end to create some products, right? Um, in the research domain, we of course use NV or, you know, again, ArcGIS, MATLAB. Uh, we heavily rely on what is called QGIS, Quantum GIS. This is open source software um, that we can use. And, and it's a good thing is, you know, it, you can add libraries and, and, and write your own algorithms and such with QGIS. So in our research, we use Quantum GIS, um, but there are some other products out there. And again, this list is not all inclusive, right? So there could be some other tools that I probably have not listed here. So that's pretty much about, you know, what's needed to do crop sensing. And so um, next few slides, I have some case studies on, on how we are using this remote sensing um, data products to understand and, and, and manage few things in our cropping system that we have, right? 
So I'll move on to um, a case study then. That um, okay. So this folks waiting outside. I think it creates a pop-up window, and I couldn't move the slides. But anyway, so the case study here um, is I'm talking about is estimating what is called crop evapotranspiration at high resolution, and then using such ET maps uh, to you know understand how your crop is using the water, and then adjusting your irrigation schedule and such, right? And remember, I talked about um, in Washington State and most of the U.S., where we have potatoes and mint and, and corn and soybean and some of these irrigated crops. You will see they are grown in circles, and these are the circles. Like if you are flying from the top, you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. So yeah, so I was talking about this, uh, the type of, you know, crops, uh, the cropping um, uh, pattern or how to say this, uh, the way we grow the crops, right? The potatoes and mint and such and the, the way we irrigate, right? So um, the, on this case study, um, Um, what we are doing here is uh, again for grapes, potato, mint, and recently we started doing this for um, apples. Um, what what we are doing is we are you know doing the ET estimation or ET mapping at high resolution. And when I say high resolution, it is about seven centimeter per pixel. Um, we are getting ET values, um, and, and the way we are doing it is you know um, we are taking the existing model, what is called metric. Uh, it's a metric is a very well-known er energy balance model, and it uses what is called Landsat 7 or 8 data, excuse me, and then, um, you know, estimates ET at 30 meter per pixel resolution. And that is good for re regional scale, but uh, if when it comes to doing crop level or plant, you know, block level management uh, of irrigation scheduling and all that, you need high resolution maps. And that this this project uh, that is funded through USDA is to do this, you know, uh, have the model that estimates ET at high resolution. And this is a data flow here. Um, we are just modifying the, the, you know, the energy balance model and and, and make, making sure all the equations are balanced and all that. And then you can see here, this is what we are getting. We are getting ET at seven centimeter per pixel. This is a grape uh, wine block. You can see you, can, you are seeing the variability here much better because of the resolution, whereas the satellite-based you know data you can see the pixelation 30 meter per pixel, and hence you are not able to um, you know see the variability. And again, with satellite you are going to have the you know the ET maps every 14 days or something, whereas with drones you can fly the drone today, and you know realistically by tomorrow you will have the you know ET maps available for your addition making, right? So that's the plan and, and, and we have a success with the grapes and, and potatoes and mint and now we are going with apples in terms of doing the ET mapping and, and so growers can use that information, right? So uh, this, this particular um, case study, uh, which is a little bit a continuation of the previous one, but not so much, is to look at, you know, in grape wines, um, in normally in, in US, we you know use drip irrigation um, to drop the water near the wines and, and have the you know uh, irrigation done for the grapes. So one of our collaborator, um, you know, because in Washington State the, the wine yard, uh, wine grape wine acreage is increasing and we have so many so many issues with the weed and all other things. So what he is trying is trying to put the emitters at subsurface. And when I say subsurface, it is at 30 centimeter, 60 centimeter, or 90 centimeter below the you know uh, the surface, and, and 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 on this project, then we were just using drone-based you know multispectral thermal imagery uh, data products to see how the wine physiology is affected by the different treatments that are being you know done by what is called deep root zone irrigation, right? 
and and you know you see the Carlos, the, the, the student from Chile who's graduated, he he did most of this work. So um, you can see you know here um, this is the block that we imaged and 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 had this uh, sub, uh, surface irrigation treatments, and and we extracted from multispectral sensor we, what is called green normalized differential vegetation index, and then we related that for different treatments of course. Uh, with what is called, you know, um, stomatal conductance, we call it pressure bomb. This is one of the ground reference method to uh, get the, you know, um, stress in 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 uh, crop or plant uh, because of the water, right? And you can see we we we, you know, the NDVI can tell you uh, that your wines are stressed and such. Uh, so that's that's the good starting point, right? Then we again use what is called, you know, thermal imaging data, where each pixel in this image is a, you know. Uh, temperature value. Uh, we extracted what's called crop water stress index, and, and then again related that to stomatal conductance. You can see the correlation or regression. Uh, well, correlation in this case, uh, you know, is very strong and negative correlation, showing that you know we can use thermal infrared imagery uh, to to understand the crop stress, right? And same thing, you can simply, if you don't want to do crop water stress, as long as your imagery is, is you know, calibrated. And, and and normalize uh, for the block for a given day, you can also use what is called canopy temperature and understand the crop stress, um, something like that, right? Um, so moving on, you know, and we have, you know, as you see, we have published all this work. If you are interested, you can, you know, just and go and download these papers, but um, we were more interested, uh, again, to how growers um, use some of these tools to, uh, not only do the irrigation management, but also um, do the crop ma crop vigor management. And you know, in the big early or mid season, uh, we do you know prune the uh, the wine blocks and all that all those things to have you know more light going to the the grape bunch and all those things. Um, so there, um, we wanted to have something on the ground, and and you can see you know one of our uh, students who graduated now. Uh, she has used what is called 3D LIDAR on the ground vehicle and mapped the canopies, the, in this case, grape wines. And we, you know, this all algorithms and everything are published here. So the bottom line is we, we, got, we got what is called canopy volume and relate that to, you know, um, the, the canopy volume measurement um, that is done on the ground with, you know, manual measurements. And we, we have very good success there. But then the point is that the LIDAR, uh, this, in this case, this is 3D LIDAR, generates a lot of data, what's called point cloud, right? And growers, um, they don't have in-house capabilities to analyze such data and, and and making these maps or, you know, the canopy volume estimates and such, right? So then we said, what else could be done? So uh, the, on the same project then, we just use, uh, you know, the drone image that we were collecting and getting this NDVI and, and do the binary scale, like the black is the ground and the white is your, Vigor, and and we projected that on the ground to get what is called canopy area ratio, and we try to correlate that with the lidar imagery and, and well not imagery but lidar point cloud estimates, and we we have very good correlation uh, with you know lidar based data products to the drone based simplified data products. So what this means is if grower want to manage the the grape wine block, do the pruning and thinning and such in early in the season. Instead of having you know uh, ground-based sensing done for you know row after row, uh, one could simply fly the drone and get this you know canopy area ratios and see which areas are more vigorous or less vigorous and do better management of those things, right? So, and and, and in continuation then. Um, so this project um, again we looked at. Using simple, you know, commercial um, drone. You might have seen the Chinese company DJI, and and simple commercial, you know, RGB sensor. Can we use that kind of you know, commercial uh, technology, uh, which is low cost, than you know, professional, you know, uh, big bulky drones to do the canopy mapping and then understand the canopy variability and such, right? So there, then we tried, you know, in grapes and apples, we tried um, different flight altitudes and then different angles. And instead of flying the drone in single mission, like just going and covering entire field, 
we do what is called double grid. So we are going, you know, one direction and perpendicular. And, and then with inclination of the sensor, we are able to reconstruct these canopies and such. But the important point that, that is there is with that, you know, 3D reconstruction of the canopies, you can get what is called tree row volume, leaf wall area, canopy volume, and such products. And these are the products then you can use uh, to do variable rate uh, chemical applications and, and anything that you want to do in the, in the sense of, you can just see this map here and say your leaf wall area is, you know, for example, higher here and, and lower in some areas. So then, well, I think the other way. And then um, you can go and, and do better management. That could be fertilizer application, that could be water management or something else, right? So having these prescription maps is what our focus was um, for the growers to have simplified information so that can you know that can be used for doing something right um, in actual field uh, production season uh, so that's pretty much about drones um, i will switch gears now and talk a little bit about uh, you know some of the things that we are doing with you know what is called uh, in field sensing and computing using iot internet of things right um, so uh, again as i said you know more Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. okay, so, all right. So, yeah, um, so this project is about apples and, and, and fresh market apples in the sense. So we grow a lot of, you know, premium varieties of the apples. The issue is, you know, because of the climate change, and you might have been following this in, in you know, in, in particular to Pacific coast uh, that we have. Um, previously, um, we used to have say about three to five days in a season and right now is the season when we will start harvesting the apples, say, around uh, mid-August uh, through, you know, um, mid-September. And this is the season where, you know, we have summer that is going on here. And then uh, we used to have three to five days where the temperature in a day will, you know, go above threshold and cause this sunburn, right? Uh, and, and, you know, have the damage to the fruit. Um, that number of days, the frequency has gone from five days, for example, to about 15 to 20 days now, right? So growers need to be very careful and they do several things to manage this sunburn. Uh, you can see here, we you know, have the shade nets or we use what is called evaporative cooling to cool the climate and the canopies and such. But as you may know that, you know, the wet canopies are, is not a good can candidate um, for food safety aspects and and we have a lot of issues with pathogens and in you know uh, foodborne diseases the, the salmonella and all other contamination uh, because the wet canopies and and you know vector growing there and all that so the, the this project then use you know some of these iot and age computing tools to manage uh, better monitor this you know fruit surface temperature so that you know grower can manage them better with you know for example actuating the evaporative cooling when it's needed then running throughout the day because growers kind of emotional uh, they run this system throughout the you know day for several days uh, weeks or months um, uh, to make sure that the fruit is not getting the you know this sunburn uh, the issue that is there is you know uh, in the us when you say fresh market the the fruit that we harvest now some of it goes to fresh market but most of it is gone in you know in a packaging house and we store it for several months and then take it out and then wash it and, and put it out in the fresh market. Uh, and so in that process, the storage, three, six months or beyond, the, you will see some of this, you know, heat stress related uh, injuries that you don't see when you harvest the fruit propagate during the storage. And when you take out about 30 or 40% of the, the bin um, uh, is kind of, you have to throw away that kind of thing. So better you manage the sunburn in the field, the better you get uh, the pack out, the yield that you are packing after you take the fruit out from the storage and, and sell, right? So, um, 
So this is a project that that you know that uses some of these technologies. You know what we are using is the thermal imaging sensor with RGB. Uh, you know integrated with what is called Raspberry Pi. It's a forty dollar computer, and we you know you can see some of the sensing nodes implemented in the field here. Uh, you know you you know this is house nicely in you know, 3D printed housing, and and we are you know looking at this field of view for example here, uh, and and we are showing some data here, but. So what's happening is you are getting RGB image of the fruits and canopies. You are getting a thermal image of the fruits and canopies. Then we are segmenting the you know fruits and getting what is called fruit surface temperature, right? Um, and if it's above threshold, then um, you, we have you know the actuation system that actuates what is called evaporative cooling. So then you are saving the water. You are better managing the sunburn and such, right? And then some something similar can be used for some other crops as well, right? But the core of it is you have a measurement system and then decisions are made and then actuation is also done uh, to just control the, you know, uh, the cooling system, the irrigation system to actuate on and off of the irrigation um, that is doing the operative cooling, right? So on the same project then some of the growers said, you know, um, of course, you know we are developing this product, and 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 it's a, this is a research thing that is going on, and we just this is our second year. They say by the time you will have the product, and some company will commercialize this, it will be like say five years or something like this, right? So by then, what else we have? And they said, can you develop something, you know, some tool for us, for us to go and you know um, see how we are doing the management, and we can use that app application or tool. Um, to to do some decision making, and so in in that process, then you know we have the smartphone, and then you probably saw this thermal imaging sensor. Uh, it's about three hundred dollar or well, four hundred dollar with tax and everything. Uh, that's a sensor that goes with the smartphone, and we have developed the application to just take the you know uh, the thermal image and RGB image and segment and all those things, and estimate what is called fruit surface temperature. Uh, we also have, you know, what is called Ag Weather Network. We have about uh, 200 plus weather stations in in our state, and so what we do uh, in the same application, we pull the nearest weather station data. Uh, you can see the weather station here, and then um, estimate fruit surface temperature using energy balance modeling approach. And then we have two data products available to the grower uh, for them to make some decision about the managing the, you know, sunburn in the orchard systems. And again, some of these can also be used for, you know, some other issues. Like we have a lot of issue with, you know, uh, early spring uh, cold or frost damage of the birds. And these birds later on become, you know, um, flower and then become the fruit and, and more damage that's happening in the beginning. That means you have less crop and all that. So growers use different uh, ways to manage it. And there's no sensing that is um, real time and smart. So Excuse me. So some of the things that we were seeing before can be used for uh, you know better management and better better monitoring and better management of these issues besides the sunburn, right? So I think the last segment of my talk is <clears throat> going towards you know management side, uh, specifically you know species management, and so. All previous slides we talked about, you know, we can use drones and, and so many other things to me, to monitor things. But you know, and as is the case with most of the situations um, in the research and everywhere, uh, we see colorful um, NDVI and green NDVI and, and crop water stress index maps, and but that never translates to um, doing the actual management. And, and sometimes we have the you know the monitoring tools, but we don't have the management tools. So um, our group, our uh, Krishna group here in Washington State, we do heavily focus or emphasize on developing the management tools as well, right? And and, and because of the funding situation, and everything, as you know, we have and there's a lot of awareness about the way we apply the pesticides and everything. So a lot of our uh, technology development that is happening right now is on. Uh, what is called precision chemical applications, right? So of course the need is there, um, and and this is probably kind of um, a good understanding for some of you back there. That you know um, when I say we grow apples or cherries or pear, 
um, we don't grow the fruit um, on a traditional bulky um, crown shaped trees, right? What we have for the last you know, 15, 20 years or so, we have what is called fruiting walls. And, and these fruiting walls, you know, they, we have maximum of about 15 feet and, 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 and you know, just having the wall up to wall with 10 feet spacing. Um, and, and it's easy to manage, easy to, you know, harvest the produce uh, because again, apples and, and cherries hand harvest. So, it, you know, you have to take the ladder, go there and harvest everything, right? Um, and, and, and all that. And, and, and then in, in case of apples, of course, when you're se selling it to consumer, uh, you have to have you know well-colored, well-sized fruit, and in this case, then you need to have more light intercepted by the canopy so that fruit gets uniform light, and and things like that, and and the fruit is good quality at least in terms of looking, and then you would buy that fruit, right? So the issue is the following: then, as we have these fruiting walls, uh, very little has changed in the way we apply the chemicals in the, these fruiting walls, right? Uh, you have seen in India and in everywhere else, right? We have these orchard sprayers. You probably have seen in citrus orchards or some of the, you know, other, you know, um, orchard systems uh, there. Um, you have this air blast sprayer where nozzle releases a droplet and then the air blast then pushes the droplet into the canopies. Remember that air blast is designed to push the chemical in these crown shaped canopies and not in the footing walls. We don't need that much air. And you can see how much chemical drift that's happening because of that air assist or air blast, right? So that's there. And then because we grow a lot of fresh market and, and for any other country who is growing fresh market commodities, um, there is something called MRL, maximum residue uh, limits of the pesticides that one should have on the produce uh, for export market. And then Okay, I'm guessing that's my problem here. So, and again, besides MRLs and the, you know, the drift issues and, and more uh, chemical application issues, we as a consumer are getting aware of the situation and we want to eat something healthy. So all in all, we need some better technologies to apply the chemicals, right? So what's out there? And these are some of the commercial products besides, um, you know, something that we are doing. Um, this is a smart sprayer that is using what is called ultrasonic sensors, um, looking at the gaps in the canopies and then actuating the some sections um, on the back of the sprayer to apply the chemicals. Uh, this sprayer here is, you know, for example, you have a drone or something else. Uh, you create a prescription map, knowing the variability and everything. And then you have a GPS system and the rate controller that, you know, uses that prescription map to actuate these sections on the nozzle here, right? And then these two sprayers um, work parallelly in USDA ARS lab in Ohio. And this is my work uh, with some of my colleagues in Carnegie Mellon and, and uh, University of Florida at, at uh, Lake Alfred. Uh, so we, in parallel, develop what is called variable rate sprayer that uses what is called LIDAR. Uh, remember, LIDAR is on this project, we had uh, John Deere and Carnegie Mellon working to develop autonomous tractor uh, using LiDAR sensing. And we were pulling the same information back and actuating the nozzles of the sprayer, right? So this is the video, I'll skip that, right? But uh, the, 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 the sweet part of the story is that right now in the US, we have you know, you know, a company called what is called Smart Guided Systems um, they are taking this sprayer, what is called Christian sprayer, forward, and 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 marketing as what is called smart guided sprayer. We call it intelligent sprayer, right? So this sprayer is nothing but you know we have a lidar system that maps the canopies, and then we have the you know what is called black box that you know uh, understand the canopy volume density parameters with respect to height in the canopies, and then actuates you know each nozzle independently on the back here. Um, uh, to apply what is called, you know, prescription uh, needed for that canopy section, right? And 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 this is now in in Washington State in in several parts of the U.S. Actually, we have this prayer being uh, 
purchased and used by the growers uh, to their benefit, right? Um, and, and, and on average, you know, depending on the crop and all, the, the saving will vary, but on average you save between anywhere between 20 to about 48% of the chemicals using the, what is called intelligent sprayers and all, right? So that's the, you know, the big impact that USDARS and, and some of us are doing in terms of chemical applications, but then that's not the end, right? Um, okay, so here. So still with air blast sprayers, even it's intelligent or not, right? We have issues with the drift because with the fruiting wall still, the intelligent sprayer is actuating nozzles and not doing anything about air assist or air blast. And then we still have issues with, you know, human exposure, exposure to other ecosystems that are there. And then you know, we have to rely on the ground conditions. And remember I said in the beginning uh, for tree fruit, we have about 500 plus acres for a given farmer. And, and spraying that many acres with you know such sprayers, you need so many of those sprayers. Uh, so on average, we have about you know 15 to 20 sprayers in the inventory of a, a grower to apply the chemicals in their orchard systems, right? So there are still issues that are there with the um, air blast sprayer. So to address some of that, we are you know developing something called you know fixed spray systems. So fixed spray systems are systems that are not moving, but they are stationary, right? Uh, and more specifically, um, they are also called what's called solid set canopy delivery system. So the concept is very simple, right? You have just like irrigation system that you have drip irrigation or sprinkler irrigation system. You have a solid set in your orchard uh, with, you know, again, we are not using the irrigation nozzles, but the micro emitters that are, that are you know, designed to uh, you know, spray the, uh, the VMD that is needed to have better deposition coverage in the canopies and their placement is very important, all that. So we have designed those configurations of solid set. And then what happens is with automation and everything, only thing that moves is, you know, the applicator unit uh, from one block to the next. And that block could be, you know, a 15 acre block or 20 acre block or 50 acre block and such. So uh, the concept is very simple, you know, uh, you take the chemical, uh, charge uh, the solid set at low PSI, what's called 20 PSI, then increase the PSI uh, to spray at about 45 PSI. You spray that chemical and then um, reduce the PSI again and push, instead of liquid, you push the air and recover everything that is left um, in, the, in the lines and then increase the PSI again, but at this, this is air PSI and then you clean the system. So the idea is nothing stays and that's a regulation, right? Nothing should stay in the tank or in the system as you are you know, done with chemical application. And, and we are, you know, we have done a lot of research, eight years of research, and now we are working with some of the private players to commercialize some of this, right? Um, and this is again in collaboration with Michigan State uh, and Washington State. Uh, Michigan State also grows a lot of apples and, and some of the berry crops. We grow a um, lot more apple. And so we are trying to, you know, find some solutions for our growers to use this, right? Again, you can think of this as a solid set that applies the chemicals. And, and remember I talked about the apple sunburn management and the, the frost management and all that. You can use the same system. We have optimized the emitters to have better deposition coverage um, of the liquid. And then you can use this for your operative cooling to manage the fruit surface temperature or um, you know, better manage the, you know, spray the water to how the, you know, the, the, the bird early spring coated with the water. And, and then you kind of, you know, reduce the damage because the frost or things like that. So, um, so that's the project. And, and we have a lot of publications done here if you're interested to read, right? I'm, I'm not going to go more on the configurations and all that, but so last part of my presentation is in terms of chemical applications, where we are in terms of aerial transition, right? So uh, you might have seen a lot more small and mid-sized drones um, that are out in the market now to apply the chemicals, right? And, and again, um, uh, this is more for um, more than agriculture. I have seen in the US at least more for, you know, vector uh, management in, you know, mosquito control and all these things in some of the urban areas, but in terms of agriculture in, in, in at least in, in US and in Washington in particular, we are seeing less applicability of these drones 
for the for the for the um, the scale application because as again you know uh, applying chemicals for five acres or 10 acres is a different scenario than applying for 500 acres right um, so we need more of what is called mid-size drones uh, that can carry more payload and spray more acreage and, and and not that technology is not there but it just has not transitioned uh, to agriculture sector right and so there's more needed on that side and this is something if you are doing research and everything um, as of now at least for us agriculture um, we don't have the scale and we spend most of our time uh, there is a survey out there you know if you are spraying with the drones about 70 percent of your time is gone uh, you know doing the you know takeoff um, landing um, going to the previous spot uh, filling the tanks and and so many of these uh, things than actual spraying time right 30 percent of your time is gone in spraying 70 percent is doing other things right that's that is one of the bottlenecks then in terms of uh, using this technology, you know, there are several types of drone platforms. So each of the drone platforms has a different airframe and, and the rotors are different on each of these. So the downwash is going to be different. Downwash is something that the propeller is pushing the air down uh, to have the deposition coverage in the canopies and, and, and things like that. So um, there's more uniformity that is needed or at least understanding of those attributes. Uh, so to know where the chemical is going then, um, and some of this is happening now, integration of sensing and spraying, uh, at least in small um, unmanned aircraft systems or small drones, uh, this is happening, but large scale, probably not. Uh, so that need to happen, right? In terms of application technology that is on these drones, right? The nozzles are different. The, um, um, for a given crop, you need to study, you know, how high you need to be, how, at what speed you need to fly the drone, to have better deposition, not cause the drift and things like that and, and have you know, better coverage. So all those things. So there's more research needed on these sides um, before we just really you know, apply this technology in agriculture, right? And these some other uh, projects that we have, I'll skip this one for now. Um, so Okay, I probably was muted. So yeah, so near future is um, again, you know, in terms of sensing, we have this low Earth orbiting satellites, um, you know, revisiting the globe in between, you know, one, well, I will say two to five days. Uh, they say every day, but I, I have not seen the date on that. But and then the resolution of those images that is coming out is between 5.5 meter to two meter, and and this could you know, go higher. In coming years, you never know, right? And so that's the future to me. Than just you know applying drones and drone-based you know uh, things for, at least for agricultural scale that we have in the United States, right? And then um, in terms of chemical applications, you will see more variable rate technologies, more autonomous tractors, and things like that. You know, apply use pulling these uh, intelligent sprayers um, for the scale, probably in 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 um, Indian context and some you know small acreage uh, context uh, you know you see this john deere is working with one of the is working with one of the european company to have uh, you know big payload lift and a little bit wider swath uh, to cover more acreage and things like that so um, this is happening and, and in you know next few years you will see some of this technology uh, used in different pieces uh, for you know monitoring and management of your uh, uh, farms or fields, right? So this is my last slide, and 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 this is a take-home message from me: is you know, um, you you might have seen this uh, Avenger series um, of movies. You know, the point is you can be you know either Avenger or you can be Thanos, right? It's it's your perspective in terms of how we produce the crop, right? Um, so. As I said, you know, like we can create colorful maps and, and figures and, and plots of your field and show it to growers and grower doesn't understand what that variability is or work on developing technology that, you know, uh, can really manage uh, some of the way, ways we apply fungicides or pesticides or herbicides. I think that 
that has to the, the bottom line is the management that has to come in um, than just creating you know fancy colorful graphs and and layers of data products right uh, so the day that happens i think we are creating healthy communities and and not um, you know having any issues with you know the way we produce the crops and all that right so with that i think uh, i will close um, again i want to um, acknowledge all the you know hard working members of my research group who do really good work and my collaborators uh, on several projects that i have presented the case uh, uh, case studies here right and with that i, I will stop uh, if you have to reach me for anything just write me an email or you know uh, things like that yeah so i will stop here um, dr beg dr ingle and dr yeah, shindi is also thank, there right yeah thank you very much sir yeah. thank you very much yeah. sir. thank you sir yeah. for your thank you for being with us Thank Very you. valuable and practical insight on digital technologies, sir, in plant protection. And uh, I request the participant to put any questions or queries in the chat box, and we will request our speaker to enlighten on the questions. Thank you. Before uh, starting the question answer session, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Lovekot, uh, who managed all the way uh, as on the eleventh hour. Dr. Uh, Jezel Christopher was in uh, crisis and emergency. so that has been postponed and immediately uh, within hours of time dr lovekot managed and i must be thankful to dr lovekot secondly we met before this in the international uh, conference at pune and uh, he is associated with all the activities of uh, national agriculture higher education program of this center and i feel uh, very happy because we have already uh started with the memorandum of understanding and memorandum of agreements with washington state in your uh, problem for the research problem formulation in coordination with dr manoj karki dr lovko dr zhang who are associated with the other uh, uh, kind of uh, programs uh, uh, in india but however uh, we uh, are making uh, this collaboration uh, in cons uh, in constructive plan of the vasantra um, naik marathwada agriculture university uh, the pg and phd students of the vasantra naik marathwada agriculture university and faculty as well those all who can start thinking of developing their research problem for uh, this university and it will be very much great pleasure that we are proceeding our uh, development of this agri boards agri drones agri agv labs in coordination with washington state uh, university uh, it is very much helpful uh, to all of us to have a uh, journey with uh, usa by constructive problem and discussion uh, with the mutual collaboration today i am happy and uh, this moment will be a historic moment as dr uh, dn gokhale sir uh, who is a beloved uh, dean and director of instruction of this university who has taken initiative to make this collaborative activities and let us panelize the group of pg phd students we are in announcing for the pg phd students to start uh, with the thinking of that what kind of uh, applications as professor kot has mentioned in this his presentation so we will uh, start with the uh, documentation as well as communication and then realistic issues which can be transferred and transformed from each other so thank you once and all thank you dr shinde sir thank you very much i think uh, mr solanki has raised the hand if he has uh, got any question he yes, can sir. ask it or put it into the chat box Yes, sir. I have uh, question to. Uh, hi, yes, sir. Uh, good morning uh, to Professor Khod, sir, and uh, uh, good morning to your present uh, everyone. My qu question very simple, sir. I have that question that uh, you are you uh, use the uh, different nozzles and uh, uh, the sprayer and uh, the develop the canopy canopy delivery system in your research group. So there is a sir pesticide residue uh, limit as you told. so what is there any sensor or any technique to measure this uh, pesticide residue because we are using the different different nozzles but after pesticide residue will remain in the uh, surface of the leaves and uh, on the uh, plant canopies 
So is there any techniques sir, for that? Okay, so uh, Solanke, I think that's, you know, that's a question that um, matters when you harvest the produce and, and you know, uh, take it to fresh market, right? Uh, so in terms of pesticide residue, um, of course, when you spray early in the season, you know that um, within, so depending on the chemical you are spraying, within say seven days or 14 days, the, there is, the chemical is going to have no little effect, right? And that's why grower need to respray, right? All that. Yes. Uh, the residue matters late in the season when the fruit is already matured or towards maturity, and then it starts accumulating that, uh, you know, the, the chemical deposits and all that, right? So in terms of detection, there is no such, I mean, advancements that I can speak of, but um, we and some other folks, uh, they are trying, um, to you know, uh, spray what is called ozonated water. Um, so ozone is highly you know regarded as as a disinfectant, right? And so um, there are some studies that show that if you spray ozone and in in lower concentrations, because higher concentrations you have phyto phytopathology effects on the fruits and everything. At lower concentrations, you can wash the produce um, in the field. And, and before you harvest, before you, you know, cross contaminate and all these things, you can reduce the, you know, MRL or the residues on, on the produce, right? So the sprayers that you see, uh, and, and, and I, I didn't, uh, I skipped one slide there. We have some sprayers that we are trying to apply those, you know, ozonated water sprays to reduce the residue levels, right? Uh, but in terms, yes. in terms of detection, there is no such thing uh, or no such sensing as of now. Uh, you have to take the, the sample produce and send it to you know analytical lab and then quantify or get it quantified that's that's how it's going so far so if you develop some sensors uh, or sensing tool that will be great for you know uh, anybody on the export market side and anyone for the growers yeah yeah yes thank, thank you, you very much thank you so thank much thank you very much sir there is another question sir from uh, participant is the ndvi images uh, image processing is also used in this method for identifying the crop stress and other things? Yes, so NDVI is a normalized difference vegetation index, right? So if you see the literature out there, mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the widely abused index in the sense that for everything, we just throw NDVI, <laughs> right? Um, NDVI is an index that shows the variation, not knowing what what is causing that variability or, or, or things like that, right? Um, but you know there are several studies that have several types of correlation and everything, right? Uh, for understanding the crop stress, yes, NDVI can be used uh, more for uh, crop nitrogen and and other variability uh, assessment, but there are other indices. If you use a better quality or better optical sensor with right optical bands, you can get specific indices that can be you know, related to some of the nutrients or water or some other stresses that are there in the plant. So NDVI is a start, I would say, and, and, and some other indices can be you know, used for meaningful exploration of crop stresses, yeah. Well, just small question, sir. Means actually, if yeah. someone want to use uh, how digital technology can ease the small and marginal farmer problems in India. Uh, one of the participant has asked because we have got very uh, small farms, and uh, yeah. digital technology is a little bit costly one. Yes, yeah. Sir. So even for U.S. farmers, it's it's a little bit costly, right? The digital digital, like say. The mechanization and and then appreciation and then digitization, that trend or that transition, it is costly for farmers here too, right? To some extent, um, I think the model that's going to work, um, and I'm just you know putting a hypothesis out there is, the you know the crop service providers, uh, which is not a lot in India, I guess, right? So growers or farmers do their things on their own. So co-ops or crop service providers uh, who provide service to you know spray chemicals. Uh, in this case, it will be service providers who can you know come to uh, your field and and do drone base or some other imaging, and and creating data products and the grower get to see that and and then you know consult with a grower or farmer and then manage that. So that kind of services need to come up, right? Um, of course, you know I understand that there there are liability issues, right? 
So you recommend something and you spray and then that, you know, that damages your crop and then farmer would always blame. So uh, the service provider. So there are several layers to this, but I think the model of co cooperatives or uh, crop service providers taking the load of sensing and digitization and creating simplified products need to be there than farmer trying to chew everything by himself or herself, right? So that's where we need to go. Um, I don't know how that will happen um, and when that will happen, but that need to happen, I guess, so yeah. Yeah, definitely, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you once again, uh, Professor Dr. Lo Koth, sir. I'm sure the lecture and discussion will long will go a long way in understanding the complexities and importance of using digital technologies in plant production, particularly. Your presentation was very informative, sir. Thank you once again, sir. On behalf of Vasant Rao Naik Marathwada Krishi Vidya Peet, Nahib Center, Indian Society of Agronomy, Parvani Chapter, and Indian Society of Plant Bidding, Parvani Chapter, and all organizing things. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. We, yeah, thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. And here we conclude our uh, today's morning session and have a great day. Thank you. Bye, guys. There is one un announcement for all the participants that uh, in the afternoon session, uh, we are having a speaker from Malaysia, a University of Putra, Malaysia, Dr. Suhazi. Dr. Suhazi will deliver the speech and presentation uh, in afternoon, four o'clock. So the little bit change in the time, uh, please note it for your presence in the afternoon, four o'clock. Thank you.